Okay, we're going to welcome you out to a virtual field trip to the Family Search Library in downtown Salt Lake City, where we can learn a little bit about a project they put together that they call Memory Lane. And we're going to go and see all the different things that they've put together in the way of devices and tools to help us to uh, digitize virtually anything that is a memory that we need to preserve. And so you're probably sitting there thinking, well, this isn't really for me, but there are several ways we can view this. We can view this for ourselves and look at the things that I'll present and show you. And, and you might think of some of the things around your house or your parents' house or you know, grandparents' house that haven't been digitized yet that maybe we ought to get onto before they totally fall apart or disintegrate. Also, it would be very helpful to us for when we go see our patrons and visit with them because you're going to find many of them uh, have these things in their homes and have no idea of how to do this for free you know, without paying big money. And then for many of you that are here, you're also involved in family search centers. And obviously we're not going to have a memory lane like these in our search center unless you have some wealthy benefactor who's willing to buy a whole bunch of things for you. But we can talk about some possible ideas of things we can do towards making our center more uh, useful to the patrons in the way of digitizing. So with that, let's see if we can go ahead and take a little tour of memory lane. First thing we got to realize is we all have this stuff. I call it matter unorganized. Sometimes it's literally boxes. Sometimes it's nicely stashed and order and nice little piles, but it basically boils down to matter unorganized and in some cases unviewed, unlooked at, unheard for decades. And so what we want to do is provide you with some ideas of how you can get these things into the circulation of your family and hopefully post it out on family search in one way or another. Understanding that this stuff is really very fragile. Heat, water, these sort of things can easily destroy them. A tornado can come through and the next that minute you just don't have them because they've been scattered literally to the wind. <clears throat> so it's really important that we, while we have these things in our possession, that we do something with them to preserve them. Okay, so what can we do? That's the big question. And the answer is rather than setting these boxes out at the curb for garbage pickup, uh, gather them up and let's convert them. And so... Family Search is put together at the Salt Lake Library and also in other places, and we'll talk about that. But we'll view this Family Search Library uh, specifically, but there are other locations that they have set up these memory lanes where you can go in for free and literally digitize anything. Okay, and we know we're a long ways away from Salt Lake. That's a view from over the Brigham Young Park. It's just uh, two blocks from the library itself. And right on the other side of the big white building, there is the temple. It's being remodeled. And we understand that, you know, it's a long ways to Salt Lake. We were lucky. We just happened to be taking our grandson up to Salt Lake to put him in his condos so that he could go to grad school at the University of Utah. And so we were up there and we were up there for a couple of three weeks. And so it was really nice to 
take advantage of it to do research and to also use memory lane. Okay, when you do go to memory lane, I apologize, it's a little hard to see, but I wanted to put all the things that they allow you to reserve. But what you'll find is they have a lot of tools. They only have so many, and they do get a goodly number of patrons. And so the smart thing to do is not to show up at this center or any others that have these without a reservation. Make a reservation ahead of time. So what I did is I pulled off the reser reservation page because it allows me to show you in one screen all the different kinds of things that they have available. Starting over here in the left column with audio cassette tapes being converted, audio reel to reel tape conversions. They have a eight and a half by 11 flatbed scanner, an 11 by 17 flatbed scanner. And they have uh, the fast photo or document scanner where you just stack a stack of pictures in it and they just whip through there at about one a second and get scanned. And they have a high speed slide scanner they have eight millimeter and super eight film digitizers, which is what I took advantage of. Many DVD converters, hi eight video, video converters, and then several different ways to do VHS conversion. Now I'll tell you one thing though about VHS, it has to be in the American format. Apparently, America had one format and the rest of the world used a different format. And the, the uh, software that they use in the library only recognizes uh, U.S. format VHS. But all of those things can be converted. They also have other machines in the building that can do other things like you see the scanning only goes up to an 11 by 17 flatbed scanner. They also have scanners out on the tables in the workrooms in the library where you can set something bigger than that down and raise the scanner up higher and scan a larger area or do a digital image of a larger area. It may not actually be a scan. But these are all different kinds of things that they did. I'm not going to focus too much on that second column as we didn't have anybody there that day that was doing uh, VHS or uh, many DVDs and things like that. But they're all, everything's pretty much the same as far as what you have to do. So seeing it with uh, the movies even is good enough to give you an idea of what has to happen. Okay, so audio files. You know, we all have some. I've got somewhere here in the room I'm broadcasting from two cassette tapes of my dad. And I've got to get those totally digitized. It's just an absolute must before they totally disintegrate on us. Because this is, you know, the opportunity to hear the person's voice. And especially for those that are gone now, this it may be the only way your aunt descendants are going to be able to hear grandpa or grandma or great grandpa, or great grandma's voice and actually hear them. And there's a connection there that is really strong when you can more than just see them but also hear them. And so what we do is we convert these over into MP3 files, which is a format that we can use nowadays and they can actually be uploaded straight into family search. They have to be no longer than, than uh, or no more than, trying to think what it is, 15 megabytes, I believe it is, which is about a five minute, 10 minute, tape. So you have to break it into small batches. You can't run a 
three hour tape. You can't upload that to Family Search. You got to break it up into little stories, sort of thing. They have equipment there. And then you notice that this equipment, as you use it to convert, you don't convert it at live speed, the speed of talking. It's a slower process. And so essentially for most cases, it is run, the, the conversion runs at about one third the real time. So a, um, um, I think I have this backwards. A 10 or 15 minute tape is going to take 30 minutes to convert. <laughs> I got it backwards on this slide and just realized that. So it, it runs at about third real speed. So it does take a little bit of time. And the machines you see there, I'll, I'll tell you off the top, right off the top here, those machines were not supplied by the church. I mean, this is to me kind of comical that here is the family search library and they've had to go out and beg and borrow to get things. And so they've gone out and asked patrons to donate things to them, which is a nice hint for us of ways that we can get things. Of course, those will not be supported by the church. So if they break down, you're not going to get the church to fix them. You'd either have to just replace them or somebody's going to have to pay to fix them. But that's how they got this equipment. Okay. On all of their machinery, they have put together some beautiful uh, hand, not handouts, but written instruction sheets that they put out on the counter for you to look at. And they walk you through step by step for the sound. The, the program they use to convert is Audacity. And that's a real good standard program that's used by just about everybody for converting audio files to digital. And so they walk you through step by step everything that you're going to need to do. And we'll talk a little bit later on about the things you need to bring with you to be able to walk out with what you want. Okay. And then, uh, you know, can I get audio equipment to convert or can I get equipment to convert? And the answer, of course, is no, you're not going to be able to at your center. Uh, but there are many devices out there. In fact, if you can get your stake to purchase them, they're not very expensive, anywhere from $20 to around $200. You can get different machines that um, will do this conversion for you. And many people probably have them in their, you know, in their collection of junk that they've gathered over the years, and you might be able to get it from somebody. And then, of course, this is a slow process, so... Expect to sit back and enjoy yourself. The gentleman on the left is the guy that runs the center, and he very much likes to sit back and chat. And so he loves to, to gravitate over to the audio or the video conversions where you're sitting for a long time and visit with you. But I mean, bring a book, bring your computer to work on, but uh, you're going to be there for a while, assuming that your tape is very long. Okay, film and video. This was just wonderful to me. Like I said, I brought in two eight or nine inch rolls of tape. In fact, that's one of mine up there on the left. And we literally had not seen these pictures in 50 years because of the problem with having not having a running projector and trying to find projectors that would work and never seeming to get one that would stay working for any length of time. And so the conversion of this is, is easy, but it's very slow because as you know, movies have a lot of little images. And those images as they have slight movements as they run through the machine cause the movement of the 
the um, picture. In fact, there's about 16 images to the second. And so uh, all those images have to be converted one at a time. So the machine on the left works for Super 8 and regular 8 millimeter movies, home movies. On the right hand side, you're seeing a, a setup for, uh, I believe there's Super 8 films and and some VHS conversion too with the bigger machine. And these things are all loaded to uh, a thumb drive. We'll be talking about that. And then you'll be able to take that thumb drive and download it to your machine. So again, they show you the conversion process and kind of how long it's gonna take the little, Movies were originally filmed on 50 foot films that you would buy and run through your camera. Those were three inch diameter little rolls. Those take 30 to 40 minutes to digitize. And if you have like a seven inch movie, like I had a couple, you're looking at 240 to 320 minutes. So you're looking at, uh, you know, four hours, five hours, or more. I was there the whole day. I had these two and I got smart. I started the one and I didn't start the second one right away. I should have, because there were two machines and they were both available. But I spent literally the whole day there and you have to stay there because if anything goes wrong or the thing skips a little bit, then the framing has to be reframed or you don't get a good copy. So, you know, you bring a good book to read and keep an eye on the machine at the same time or work on your laptop or something like that. A slow process, but the end result is you have a digital file of that movie in movie form, just like watching a video. Okay, now what if I want to do it myself? Well, they use the Wolverine brand machine. And you can buy those through Amazon. You see, I pulled up a, a example on Amazon of this. And it's, it's pricey. It's $399 on sale. And, you know, Christmas time, it'll drop. It'll probably drop down to $299 or so. But the thing is, uh, if you do, if you want to, want to, you can go out and pay somebody to do these. There's a lot of companies that will convert them, and each one of those rolls of film will cost you over a hundred dollars. And if, so, if you have several rolls of film, it's actually economical to buy one of these and do it yourself if you can't get to a library. And then, if you were real sweet, you would donate it after you've done all your films and really don't have a need for it anymore, donate it to your local center, and then the center will be able to really offer something cool to their patrons. But anyway, that's that's kind of the, the way to go. This is a Wolverine brand. There are several other brands, and some of them are a little less expensive. This just happens to be the one that Family Search uses. And I'm, I was familiar with it because I have some other Wolverine products of my own that I've bought over the years. Okay, and again, like I've mentioned down here on the VHS, only US-centric format will work for VHS, Betamax, and all that. Whoops. Got carried away there. Photos, slides, and negatives. Okay, high-speed photo and flatbed scanners can digitize your photographs. Slides ranging from old tin types and glass slides to negatives to uh, photographs from various types of cameras. All these things can be digitized. It's really neat. It does help to organize before you come though. That would be the smart thing to do. 
Okay, for the slides, they have a couple of different ways. They have a fast uh, feeder, that a fat, what they call a fast loader, where they just stack the pictures, the, the slides in this pile, and they go into the machine and run through them on a fairly fast pattern. And they get the pictures of them. What they're doing here is they're projecting the slide onto a screen in that machine and there's a camera in the front the church has provided a 35 millimeter camera or not a 35 but a digital camera in the front there and the camera is taking the pictures and saving the pictures to um, a um, uh, card card reader and that way they have all the images that way now is you notice that machine has also got a carousel on it you can use a carousel but it takes a lot longer to load and unload that you'll also notice that gentleman is sitting there and he's organizing slides if you come in with them already organized you can save yourself a lot of time if you come in unorganized you're going to spend a majority of the time that you reserve just sorting through your things, trying to decide which ones really need to be converted and which ones might not, or which ones you want to get done today opposed to what you can wait and do later. Okay, they can do the negatives. Now you may have, you may have a um, scanner at home that has a negative feeder where you can run a, a negative through there and it can convert it to a positive image and digitize it yourself. But a lot of us don't have that. And so they have the capability with these Wolverine machines and other scanners that they have there to take your old 35 millimeter negatives that come in these strips and run those strips through the machine taking an image of each one of the pictures that's on it. And they use uh, ScanPro 3000 Ultra Microfilm Scanner that's on the second floor to do that for black and white. And if they're color, uh, They can be done with the scanners that are there in memory lane itself. They have some scanners out there in the on the shell on the, the tables and work areas that are used actually for the the um, microfilm, but these can be run through those microfilm viewers and digitized from that, just as well as microfilm. And so they recommend for the black and white ones that you just use the microfilm scanners that are out on the, the tables around the, the library. And this color ones use the machine that's in the, the library because it's set up to handle color images. The microfilms weren't in color. Okay, photos and documents. You get all kinds of photos and documents. You get big ones, you get little ones, you get odd sizes, you get brittle ones, you get some that are, you know, on hard cardboard and won't bend. And you need to be able to, to do things quickly is best to sort by size. And if they can be run through the high speed scanner, run them through that. If not, you can put them on the flatbed like this lady's doing, and when you do the scan, it will separate each image into a separate image. And that works good, especially when the pictures are fragile. It might, you know, just disintegrate if you run them through the fast scanner, or if they're real hard and they won't bend so that they can get through the fast scanner, then this is the way you'd want to go. These are actual patrons that were working there when I was, was there. This was a, a woman and her granddaughter. And she was teaching her granddaughter 
the family as they were scanning. Okay, this is my favorite little machine. This is an Epson high-speed scanner. You'll see the little slider things there. You sort your pictures all to the same size, and then you set them in there and spread or narrow the, the arms of that to hold the slides there. And you hit copy, and they go through it about one every second or two. And they are scanned, and I set them for ultra high density scan so they were real good very very large sized files tiff files and uh, it did the original image and then it did the back of the image if there was anything on the back including watermarks and stuff like that most of those we just threw out, but if there was any writing on the back, it would automatically be saved also. And then with the software that was on the, the machine, we could also enhance the image and improve it. So I got the original raw image, I got the back of the photo image, and I got an enhanced image all at about one per second or one every other second. It was just really a neat, neat experience. This is Epson. There are several different brands of them, and they all run around two hundred and fifty to five hundred dollars. So they're expensive. Um, we'll talk about. Uh, I believe these were given to the center by the church. This is one of those things that the flatbed scanners. These fast feed uh, copiers, these were all given to the church or given to the to the library by the church. They didn't have to beg or borrow these. These were provided. Okay, now here's a flatbed scanner again. And it, it really is nice. You can see there that the uh, when they scan, it scans uh, the image over onto the computer that's hooked up to it. And you can see how each image is being blocked so that it can be a separate image in the collection of pictures that this person is gathering. You don't have to do them one at a time. You don't have to block them up. The machine separates all the pictures. If you have an album where everything's stuck in it, and you can't get them out, you take them there and you put them up page by page and the machine separates all the pictures into the separate pictures. Slower than the high-speed copiers, but it does what's needed. And it's a heck of a lot faster than the, the scanners that we have at home. So even though it's slower than the high-speed one, it's high-speed compared to what we have in our houses in most cases. Okay, book scanning. They have all kinds of scanners all through the library for scanning books. And so, you know, for them, it's just a matter of uh, sometimes what kind of a book it is, what shape it's in, what size it is to determine which is the best thing to copy it with. What's really neat is the ones that they have out on the, the tables throughout the library for patrons to copy books rather than having to take them up to the scanner, you know, that stands up there that you have to walk up to. You can just sit there and do it. They will allow you to lay the page down. And even though the pages may curl in to the binding, the software flattens it out. So instead of it being angled, it becomes flat and everything is straight. So they have some pretty cool uh, scanners. They also have a set of unique scanners with different situations or different situations. They have the one there that's already got the V to lay a book in that might be fragile and you don't want it opened all the way or it might break the back. And so they have different kinds of scanners. And so it, it's really neat 
to see the you know the different machinery that they have and then i think in most cases these were all provided by salt lake now a couple of small items almost everything that you see there that was done you can't hook up your computer to the device that's doing the copying they don't allow that and so what they do is most of the time the materials are scanned to the an sd card and a 32 megabyte or gigabyte one for some reason i was told by the guy that ran it that the 32 gigabyte cards are the ones that are the most uh, successful in getting copies for whatever reason. So they have stacks of these and you check it out and you give them your driver's license and then they give you back your driver's license when you return the card. Then what, what happens is they put the images on the SD card like say my movies, they were put on an SD card. Then that's taken over to a computer. If I don't have a computer that has that size slot, my slot's a little teeny tiny slot, so it doesn't work. So they take that card over to one of their computers that has the wide SD card slot, put it in there, and you need to supply a uh, thumb drive. And you you copy the files over from the SD card to the thumb drive. In fact, what they did is that they gave me that thumb drive. I had the lanyard, but they just gave me the thumb drive and said, here, use this. And I guess they had tons of them because they all have the family search logo on it. And they figure that's good advertising. But then you take that thumb drive and then you plug it into your computer and download the material and it's yours and it's all ready to work. It's all in the format that you need. And the thumb drive, I think, was a uh, 64 gig thumb drive, something like that. And it held everything I did and more without any trouble. Okay, so... When and how can you use this particular location? They're open Monday, Friday, and Saturdays from 9 to 6, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 9 to 8. Those are the hours of the, of the Family Search Library, by the way. The only day they're closed now is on, on uh, Sundays. They open the other six days of the week. You can walk in, but you would strongly recommend reservations. And that would go for anywhere that you go that you want to uh, use this kind of material, this kind of machines, because you don't want to make a trip to a town and then find out that A, they're not open, or B, the machine's broken, or C, there's eight people waiting in line. You don't want that to happen. Okay, remember, everything there is free. That's what's beautiful. All you need to do is invest your time. And then I provided the link there. Actually, if you just go online and you put in Family Search Library, Memory Lane Reservation, Reservations, it'll come up. But there's a link where you go in and you make your reservations. Okay, so now what are other options do we have? Because quite frankly, we're, in, for many of us, not everybody that watches this, but for many of us, we're in the Central California. And so what are we going to be able to do? I've asked around a little bit, and none of our centers have full capabilities like this. There's just nothing. There is one in Sacramento. The Sacramento Family Search Center is a regional center. It's a multi-stake center. If you have a multi-stake center, this recognized by the churches as what they would call a regional type center, then you become eligible for a lot of these pieces of equipment. And so, you know, this is where, this is the closest place that we can go to from Fresno to 
avail ourselves of a lot of this equipment. In fact, having talked to the director of that center, they have virtually everything. They can do any of the digitizing that we talked about today. But they strongly suggested make a reservation before you come in. Now, you can also go for other places here in California. Oakland has a regional center there at the temple. Los Angeles has one at the temple site there in LA temple grounds. So they have the big library there. In Orange County, they have one. I'm not sure exactly where, but it's in Orange County. And then down in San Diego, there's one. So there are five of these regional centers here in California that we can go to and get this service and be able to do this copying. Now, I went to one in, in Utah when we were there in Payson, which is not a big city. It's just a small community south of Provo. And uh, I walked in there and, and they have, uh, they've converted an old, uh, sem well, it wasn't old, it was a fairly new seminary building that had been used for just ninth grade at a middle school that got turned into a, a, a junior high that was turned into a middle school. And so they couldn't have seminary there anymore. So they had converted it to a little mini center. And I actually needed it because in Salt Lake in the library, I broke my movie film and I needed to splice it. And they didn't have a splicer, but in Payson, little Payson, they had the splicer and the tapes to put it back together. And so I was able to do that there. And so there are centers around that have started gathering things. And I asked them, you know, how they got stuff. And they said a lot of it came from patrons and uh, they were just thrilled to be able to provide this service. Okay, so what can we do to provide these services for our center? First of all, understand that uh, the services that you're eligible for at the center are dependent upon hours of operation, number of patrons that attend. That's the real bottom line of everything. If you want more computers, you want new computers, you want a copy machine, hours of operation, number of patrons are key factors. Okay, what can you do beyond that? Because you're not going to get much else from Salt Lake for just a regular center like most of ours. Open up a dialogue with your stake president. In fact, I know for a fact that one of our stake presidents in our local area here is looking at buying some of this and sent one of his high counselors to talk to me about that, knowing that we were having this presentation and he wanted that information so that he could take it to the stake president. And then the other thing is to start dialoguing with your patrons. You know, understand if you get donated equipment, you can't fix it. You know, you can't uh, get it fixed by the church. They won't fix it, but you'll have it. If it breaks, then I guess you just have to beg, borrow, whatever from somebody else. But you will have this in your collection. And that would be an easy way to get started is to just start asking your patrons, ask your ward members if there's any of them, especially the older people that may have done some digitizing and now they've got this machine stuck up in the shelf somewhere and they might be willing to give it up. So consider that. Okay. All I can say though is good luck. I hope this has opened your eyes to some of the things that can be done because it really is exciting to see all the things that we're able to do. And, you know, I, I wish you good luck either personally or as a uh, family search center in getting this equipment and being able to provide it for your, your patrons or guide your patrons to where they can do this. Okay, we'll stop the 